Okay, got the live stream started. Anybody joining after it's been uploaded, please feel free to fast forward. Got some people joining now. How is everybody doing? Tonight's topic is the great controversy. We will be talking about is God at fault for what's going on in the world? Why does God let bad things happen to good people? So you guys like and share, get this live stream out to other people so that they can join in on the Bible study. I'm going to give everybody a few minutes to join uh, just so that they can be here. I'm doing okay. I'm tired. I'm ready for this week to be over, though. Um, it's, I work outside. It's hot. Uh, for those joining, tonight's Bible study is Why Does God Let Bad Things Happen to Good People? The Great Controversy. Yeah, I saw that, the, that the Adventist Church in, in Maui is still standing, which is amazing. So God has protected many people throughout that disaster. And many people have, have been affected negatively. Many people have died in that disaster and in others. And we're going to talk about that tonight. Why does God allow these things to happen? Why does God allow these disasters that, that destroy people's homes and destroy people's lives? That's a question a lot of people are asking right now because disasters are ravaging the planet, right? So please feel free to like and share the live stream get this out going out to other people especially to people who are wondering why God is allowing these things to happen so does anybody have anything any prayer requests or praises that they would like to share uh, before we get started with our study I know I started a little bit early tonight um, okay all right Let's go ahead and pray, and we'll get started, all right? <laughs> hey, Andrew. All right. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for bringing us all to another study, for being so good to us, for in spite of everything that's going on in the world, that you are still holding out your salvation to everyone. Lord, forgive us for our sins. Please send us the Holy Spirit so that we can understand why the world is in the condition that it's in. Why you allow evil to happen. Please be with us, Lord. Please uh, answer all the different prayer requests and praises that people may have. In your name, amen. So, why does God allow bad things to happen to good people? So, I don't have my computer open for our normal Bible study. We usually go with Amazing Facts, but tonight we're going to go with this one. It's from a book called Studying Together by Mark Finley. He used to be the speaker director of It Is Written, and now he's got a ministry called Hope Lives 365. So, this book, Studying Together by Mark Finley, there is a study in here called The Origin of Evil, and it's on page 5. And we're going to go over a few other texts as well. So we're going to start in 1 John chapter 4, verse 8. So if you have your Bible, whether it's on a hard copy Bible like the one I've got right here, or whether you've got a tablet or another phone or a computer, that you can, you're going to need your Bible tonight. It's not on a website like we normally do. Um, so you're going to need some form of a Bible tonight. So our first text is found in 1 John chapter 4, verse 8. So the toxic metals out of your child's brain. Absolutely. Um, 1 John chapter 4, verse 8 says, He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. So this is what I tell people many times before, and I will always continue to tell people this, that every doctrine in the Word of God has to be studied by this text. God is love. God is often described in His Word as a God of justice, as a God of vengeance even as a God who sends judgments on the wicked. Uh, he's described by various different adjectives, but this is in here, it says God is a noun, right? It's not love as in an adjective or love as in a verb. It's, it's God is love as in a noun. And so every other doctrine in the word of God needs to be studied through the lens of God is love. We often say we need to study the Bible through 
whatever culture we're in or whatever culture they were in. And there is some truth to we need to study the Bible with through the lens of Hebrew culture or Greek culture, so long as it agrees with the Bible. But above all, we need to study it through the fact that God is love. Yeah, Laura says over here on Instagram, uh, at times the tests or trials can be a testimony, and sometimes things happen because of our own doing, hence the consequences. Yes, that's true. Seven years clean, ten years in prison. Well, praise the Lord. Awesome. Some of the most passionate Christians I've ever met have been ex-inmates. Um, and so, God is... Love. That will set the foundation for this entire study tonight. Now we're also going to do... Oh, I put that down a little hard. We're also going to do Daniel chapter 2. So we've read 1 John 4 verse 8. And by the way, in 1 John chapter 4, it says it twice. In verse 8 and verse 16, it says that God is love. Happy Wednesday, Gonzo. Um, now we're going to go to Daniel chapter 2. Now this is also a very foundational scripture for this study. That's a great idea, my friend. Definitely start that YouTube channel. Um, Daniel chapter 2, and we're going to read verse 20 and 21. And it says, Daniel answered, this is after God had given him the dream. There's my friend from New Zealand. Thank you for coming. Um, this is after Nebuchadnezzar had the dream. Daniel prayed. God gave him the vision. And Daniel's about to explain the vision, but first Daniel says this. He says, Blessed be the name of God forever and ever, for wisdom and might are his. He changes the times and the seasons. He removes kings and sets up kings. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to them that know understanding. So the word of God here so far that we've learned is one, God is love. Two, God is in control. We, 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 especially here in American culture, for, for my American followers and for those who aren't, here in this country, it's become so politically divided that Republicans and Democrats are at each other's throats saying, you're the problem, we're going to fix it. And the other side says, no, you're the problem, we're going to fix it. When people don't realize that the Bible says that God is the one in control. President Joe Biden is only the president because God allowed him to be, Right. Same with Trump, Obama, and everyone who came before him. They were only the leaders because God allowed them to be. So God is the one in control. Yet many of the leaders of the world are, are uh, in the same group. Yes, that's, that's true. Now, let's read Psalm 33. We're setting a foundation for what we're going to talk about. Psalm 33. Now, Psalm, if you're new to Christianity, Psalms is right after the book of Job. Now, Psalm 33, verse 6, it says, By the word of the Lord were the heavens made, and all the hosts of them by the breath of his mouth. Verse 9, For he spake, and it was done. He commanded, and it stood fast. So God is love. God is in control. And God is all-powerful. Right? So in spite of everything going on in the world today, God is all-powerful. He's in control. He's got this covered. There is nothing going on in the world today that, that God didn't know about. None of this is taking God by surprise. Do I own a Bible? I own a few. Uh, my, there we go. my watch was trying to bother me. Um, the Bible I'm using, if you guys would like to know, is the large print remnant study Bible. Because I can't see very well, so I have large print. Who is God? We're speaking of God the Father and Jesus and the Holy Spirit. Um, all right. Now, Psalm 24, verse 1. Psalm 24, verse 1. Turn with me there. The Bible says, The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell therein. So, in the Bible, God is love. God is in control. God is got all of this covered. And God owns the world. God is the king and creator of this world. Satan claimed dominion of this world when he deceived Adam and Eve, which is why he told Jesus, uh, worship me and I'll give you everything. And Jesus says, yeah, I don't think so. Be gone. And the Bible says here that the earth is the Lord's. Satan claims the earth as his, but 
the Bible says that the earth is the Lord's. Now, the Bible, someone's requesting Psalm 83, 18, and that says that men may know that thou, whose name alone is Jehovah, art the most high over all the earth. So God is in control of the earth. Now, if you're going to be in the chat, remain respectful, or uh, you will be muted. So, um, now, turn with me to Jeremiah 31. Jeremiah 31. If you don't have your Bibles, grab it. You need it. Psalm, uh, sorry, not Psalms. Jeremiah 31, verse 3. Share and like the live with other people so that we can get this message out to the world, especially with what's happening in Maui, with what's happening on the west coast of the United States, in Houston, Texas, uh, in other parts of the world, the fires and flooding. This message of God is love needs to go to the world. Uh, so for my chat moderators, that's a great idea. If you put the verse in the chat, that is a thank you for doing that. Um, Jeremiah thirty one three says, The Lord hath appeared of old unto me, saying, Yea, I have loved thee with an everlasting love. Therefore, with loving kindness have I drawn thee. So many people accuse God of being a vindictive, angry tyrant. Now, how many of you grew up with authoritarian parents who... who Said so you have to do what I say, and you have to do it now, and they never showed you any love. Right, that's what people accuse God of being. Please continue to like and share the life. I grew up a family in a family like that, and so I grew up with a very skewed picture of God. And it was not until fairly recently, in the last 10, 15 years, that God really started changing that that picture of of Him for me. And so the Bible here is saying that God has drawn us with His everlasting love with his everlasting loving kindness now turn with me now to isaiah 41 verse 10 remember we are setting the foundation isaiah 41 verse 10 this is one of my favorite texts in all of isaiah perhaps in all of the bible isaiah 41 verse 10 and read the context as well isaiah 41 10 says fear thou not for i am with thee be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee, yea, I will help thee, yea, I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. So how many people in the world are going through a hard time? Almost everybody. Almost everybody, if not everybody. Inflation's at an all-time high. Politically, this country and world are divided. There's revolutions going on in the world. There's revolutions that are about to start happening. And in spite of all of the difficulties that we see and experience, God says, I am with you. I am here to help you, God is saying to us. And in verse 13 of that same chapter, God says, For I, the Lord thy God, will hold thy right hand, saying unto thee, Fear not, I will help thee. Now, turn with me also to, I believe it's Isaiah 49. Isaiah 49, I think it's 49. Yes, Isaiah 49, verse 16, it says, Behold, I have graven thee upon the palms of my hands. Thy walls are continually before me. Now, this word graven is a very interesting text, uh, or word, rather. And it, it means literally to hack. So, like, you have a hammer, it means to hack. Jesus has hacked him, our names on his hands. He, he's his... his the nail scars that he still bears are for us. They're the sign of his love for us. And so we have this picture in the word of God that God is love. God wants nothing more than to save us. And remember, the book we're going through is Studying Together by Mark Finley. And you can find this on eBay. Um, I'm not sure if it's on Amazon or not, but I found it on eBay. Now... Turn with me to Matthew 13. We're going to get into really the meat and potatoes of this study now. Matthew 13. And we're going to the parable of the wheat and the tares. Matthew 13, verses 36. And it's 36 to 40. Matthew 13, verse 36 to 40. 
And it says, Then Jesus sent the multitude away and went into the house, and his disciples came unto him, saying, Declare unto us the parable of the tares of the field. And he he answered, wait, I make sure I got the right text here. No, I got the wrong text, sorry. <laughs> um, Matthew 20, 13, verse 24. I'm sorry, guys, I gave you the wrong text. Matthew 13, 24. Same chapter, just a little bit older. The kingdom of heaven, Jesus says, is likened unto a man which sowed good seed in his field. But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares, or weeds, among the wheat, and went his way. And when the blade was sprung up and brought forth fruit, then appeared the tares also. So the servants of the householder came and said unto him, Sir, didn't you sow good seed in your field? From whence then hath the tares? And he said unto them, Notice this phrase. Notice this phrase. He says, An enemy has done this. So this farmer, he's gone out into his field, and he's planted all of these good seeds, these beautiful plants for food, for fragrance, for supplies, for, for what have you. And then his servants a little bit later... Uh, they come out and they notice something's not quite right with some of the plants. And then they go out a little bit later, and then the difference becomes even more stark and apparent that that these are good plants here, but this plant right next to it, that's a weed. That doesn't belong there. And by definition, a weed is simply a plant that you don't want there. Um, I appreciate all the likes and shares. Please continue sharing this lesson to other people. And for those watching on TikTok, this will be on my Instagram page as well. So you can watch the reruns later. Um, and so his servants come to him and they say, Dude, boss, uh, something, something's wrong. These plants, there, there's weeds here. What's going on? And, and, and the boss, the farmer, says that uh, the enemy's done this. The, it's an enemy. And so he says that the servants say, Well, should we go pluck them up? And, and the farmer says, No, you don't, don't pluck them up just yet. Let them grow together, and then when the harvest comes, we'll separate them. So, Jesus is telling us here, an enemy has planted these weeds. It, it, for those of you who have insurance, at least here in the United States, a lot of insurance companies define natural disasters as things, uh, they call it by the title of an act of God. And they call it that simply to give themselves an excuse not to have to pay for something. So if a tornado comes through and tears down your house, a lot of insurance companies will refuse to pay for it because they call it an act of God. But the Bible here is telling us it's an enemy that has done this. Who started the fires that are going on in the world? Who did the flooding? It's an enemy that has done this. It's, it's, it, it's not God that has done this. Greetings to those just joining. We are studying. This one is called The Origin of Evil in the book Studying Together by Mark Finley. Now, turn with me. We're going to go back to the Old Testament for a couple of texts. Turn with me to Ezekiel 28. And we are going to study the fall of Lucifer for a little bit. Ezekiel 28, verses 12 to 17. Ezekiel 28, and somebody's requesting another text. Let me look that up real quick. 33, The Bible says in Deuteronomy 31, 33, 27, The eternal God is thy refuge, and underneath are the everlasting arms, and he shall thrust out the enemy from before thee, and shall say, Destroy them. So God is our refuge. And God will destroy our enemies. Now, Ezekiel 28, verses 12 to 17, the Bible says, Son of man, take up a lamentation to get upon the king of Tyrus, and say unto him, Thus saith the Lord God, Thou sealest up the sum full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. This is describing Lucifer and what led to his fall. Thou hast been in the garden of, or, or, in, or in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was thy covering. So this gives us the picture that the garden of Eden was in heaven before it was on earth. Which is very interesting. He says, every precious stone was thy covering. The sardis, topaz, the diamond, a few others it lists. The workmanship of thy tablets and of thy pipes, his vocal cords, was prepared in thee in the day that thou wast created. 
Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth, and I have set thee so. Thou wast upon the holy mountain of God, and thou hast walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. Thou wast perfect in thy ways from the day that thou wast created until, until iniquity was found in thee. So first, Lucifer was this perfect, happy, holy, created angel. He was most likely the first angel ever created. And so the Bible describes him as being extremely beautiful, extremely talented. He had a set of vocal cords that would make the most talented human singer sound like pure garbage. He, he was incredibly talented. And the Bible says that he was a covering cherub. Now, if you read the book of Exodus and Leviticus especially, it describes the covering cherubs in the most holy place. There, there were two of them that were, that were handcrafted and placed on top of the mercy seat of the Ark of the Covenant. And they, they were to be looking down toward the law of God. So Lucifer was a covering cherub whose job was to guard and protect the law of God. And... And he, he walked, uh, the Bible says, he walked up, up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. He, he was upon the holy mountain of God. Now, if you look in the Bible, a mountain is symbolic of a kingdom. That's right. He was looking after God's law. And, and he was in the mountain of God, which is the kingdom of God. And so he was a very powerful angel, if not the most powerful angel ever created. And the Bible says he was perfect until... Until iniquity was found in thee. And what iniquity was that? The Bible says in verse 16, By the multitude of thy merchandise, they have filled the midst of thee with violence, and thou hast sinned. Have you ever heard the phrase, because what, what could this possibly refer to, the, merch, the, the merchandise? What could this possibly be referring to? Well, have you ever heard the phrase, <clears throat> I don't buy that. And I'm not talking about a pen or something that you can go buy in a store. Somebody tells you something that um, you don't believe. And so uh, if you don't believe them, you might say, I don't buy that. That can't be true. So Lucifer's, one of Lucifer's first sins was dishonesty. It was lying. The Bible says, therefore, I will cast thee as a prof as profane out of the mountain of God, and I will destroy thee, O covering cherub, from the midst of the stones of fire. And then in 17, thine heart was lifted up because of thy beauty. So Lucifer's, one of his major sins uh, in the beginning was lying, dishonesty. Um, and then it says that his heart was lifted up because of his beauty. So he became very arrogant and prideful what did he lie about he was a covering cherub he knew god's law better than any other created being in the universe and so who better to deceive people about god's law than one who knows it better than anyone um and because of his beauty again he, he became very prideful he became very arrogant and god says i will cast thee to the ground i will lay thee before kings that they may behold thee and it goes on to say, Thou hast defiled thy sanctuaries by the multitude of thine iniquities, by the iniquity of thy traffic, or traffic in, in which means trade. Therefore will I bring thee, uh, I will bring forth a fire from the midst of thee, it shall devour thee, and I will bring thee to ashes. So this is one of those texts that shows us that hell is actually not eternal, but that's a study for another topic. How did Satan lie? Well, the Bible, which we'll get to in a little bit, the Bible talks about how Satan deceived a third of the angels. Um, and so these are some of the different sins that led to Satan's downfall. Now turn with me back to Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 14. Isaiah chapter 14, and we are going to read verses 12 to 14. Isaiah 14, 12 to 14, it says, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? 
How art thou cut down to the ground which didst weaken the nations? For thou hast set in thine heart. Here's another one of Satan's sins that led to his downfall. I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. Now, here in this chapter, did, did Lucifer really want to be like God in character, or did he want something else? Satan wanted God's power. He didn't want to be like God. If Lucifer really wanted to be like God, in, as described in this text, if he, if he really wanted to be like God, he would have repented and taken his position as a servant of God. But no, Satan wanted God's power. So you read this text, even in verse 13 and 14 of Isaiah 14, there are so many eyes here. Satan says, I will do this, I will do that, I will be this, I will become that. So Satan's problem was that he was focused on himself. And the Bible says, yet thou shalt be brought down to hell, or, or to the grave, to the sides of the pit. Now, this is very interesting. It says, They that see thee shall narrowly look upon thee and consider thee, saying, Is this the man that made the earth tremble, that did shake kingdoms? So God's people are going to see the punishment of Satan at some point and say, Well, it is, is it, that's it? That's the one that pestered us so much? Now, I don't mind if you have questions or anything like that, but keep them respectful, please. And don't spam the chat with a bunch of comments. Now, turn to Revelation chapter 12. We are talking tonight about why does God allow bad things to happen to good people. From this book, we're going in Studying Together by Mark Finley, The Origin of Evil. Now let's read Revelation chapter 12, verses 7 to 9. And in this chapter, in these scriptures, it says there was war in heaven. So Lucifer became prideful in his appearance, in his talents. He began attacking the law of God because he was a covering sheriff whose job was to protect the law of God. And so Satan says, no, I'm going to attack the law of God because we need a reformation. We need a revolution, right? And so God's was, was very patient with Lucifer. And many people say, well, why didn't God destroy Satan right away? And that's a valid question. That, that's a good question. And when I was teaching uh, Bible class a few years ago, um, I asked the kids this. So let's say if I took, let's, let's, uh, let's call him Mark, okay? Let's make up a name. We'll call him Mark. Let's say Mark is talking trash about me. And I say, hey, Mark, let's go out back. Let's talk. And then I come back, and then nobody ever sees Mark ever again. Um, well, thank you, my friend. Um, <clears throat> how many of those students would continue to trust me after that? How many of those students would willingly learn from me after that? Probably none of them. If God would have destroyed Lucifer right away, all the other angels, all the other uh, inhabitants of the other planets would have served God out of fear. They would not have served God out of love anymore. And so God wants the service of love because God is love. So he couldn't destroy Lucifer right away. He had to let his character become manifest. And we're still going through that process. Now... In Revelation 12, the Bible says there was war in heaven. This is verse 7. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought and his angels, and prevailed not, neither was their place found any more in heaven. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceives the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. So, we see this war happening. right? Lucifer's rebellion was more covert at first. In fact, I don't think Lucifer even understood what his rebellion was all about at first until it got to a point where he had to repent or fully commit to his rebellion. And the Bible says there came a point where there was war in heaven. 
Now, this wasn't a war of, of swords and weapons and things like that. The, the picture that the Bible gives us, especially in the Greek, is that this was a war of words. Imagine a political campaign. Now, I grew up in a period of American history, and it's even worse now, that during presidential elections, uh, especially congressional elections as well, one side is always publishing smear campaigns against the other side. And... They, they both, both sides do it to each other. And they do it because they want the votes. And so, Lucifer was throwing that smear campaign at God. He was attacking God's character. Because remember, the Ten Commandments of God are his character. You guys have seen that in my videos before, if you regularly watch my videos. God's commandments, his Ten Commandments, are his character. And so, Satan was attacking that, and it got to that point where, okay, Satan's rebellion was now fully out in the open. And God now has a decision to make. Is God going to allow that rebellion to continue to get worse in heaven? Or is he going to do something about Lucifer's rebellion? And the Bible says that God chose to cast Satan out of heaven. He could no longer allow Satan's rebellion to continue in heaven, so he cast him out of heaven to somewhere else. Now, the Bible says that he was cast out into the earth and that his angels were cast out with him. And the Bible says that his tail drew a third of the stars. A star in, heaven, a star in Bible prophecy is symbolic of an angel. So Satan, or also known as the dragon, his symbolic tail, remember, tail uh, in Ezekiel uh, alludes to deceptions. He, through Satan's deceptions, he deceived a third of the angels. So Satan now has a third of the angels on his side. God has two-thirds of the angels on his side. And now we've got this controversy going on. In fact, many people, such as myself, call it the great controversy. Now, turn with me to Luke chapter 10. Luke chapter 10, verse 18. This is in the book of Luke chapter 10. And we're going to read verse 18 and a little bit of the context. Now, Luke chapter 10, the context is Jesus sending out the disciples on... The, actually, it's, it's not just the 12 disciples, it's the 70. He sent them out, and he sent them out on, their, for, on one of their missionary tours. Go preach the gospel of the kingdom, go heal the sick, go cast out demons, uh, heal the blind, uh, all, all that kind of stuff. And it says in verse 17, the 70 returned again with joy, saying, Lord, even the devils are subject unto us through thy name. And Jesus' response is very interesting. Remember, people believed in Jesus as the Messiah, but not very many people, you know, if anybody, believed in Jesus as God at this point, right? And Jesus' response to that, he, he says, I beheld Satan as lightning fall from heaven. So, you have this picture of rebellion in heaven. The Bible says Michael and his angels, who I believe is another name for Jesus. And it says that Satan was cast out from heaven by, the, by command of Michael. <laughs> nervous. I'm not nervous about this, trust me. Now, what happens after Lucifer's rebellion from heaven? What happens after he's cast out to the earth? And the Bible almost gives us the picture that Lucifer was cast down here while the earth was still without form and void. Now, let's go to Genesis chapter 1. We've talked about the war in heaven. We've talked about God's character. Now we're going to talk about where humanity comes into the picture. Genesis chapter 1. We're going right back to the beginning. Genesis chapter 1, verse... 27 to 31. The Bible says, So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he him. And the Bible says, Be fruitful. God says to them, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, and over every living thing that moves upon the earth. So here God has created the earth, and he has created Adam and Eve 
Now, what was Adam and Eve's purpose? Now, think about what their purpose could have been. Lucifer's rebellion has just happened in heaven. Lucifer is cast to the earth, and then God takes the earth from what it was. The Bible says without form and void. There could have been a giant rock here or something. Who knows? Um, but it wasn't the earth yet. And so God goes through Genesis chapter 1. He creates the earth, and then he creates two inhabitants, the first two humans. Hi, Luna. And my wife's cat is over here. She likes to join me during live streams. Um, so, what could their purpose have been? Now, if we read in Genesis chapter 2, the Bible says that uh, God comes to man and he says, Every plant of the field, this is Genesis chapter 2 verse 5, Every plant of the field before it was in the earth, for the Lord God had not caused it to rain. And then it says that God placed Adam in the garden and he told Adam, in verse 9, uh, that, I'm trying to make sure I got the right verse, God, the tree of life, the tree of life is in the midst of the garden, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, okay, and a little bit later, the, God says to Adam, that you can eat from every tree in the garden, except for this one over here, all these trees over here, great, eat from those trees, this one over here, this is the only one, you can't eat from that one, don't do it. If you eat from that one, you're going to die. And so, um, what we see here is that God is warning Adam and Eve that there is a consequence to sin. And he's warning Adam and Eve that there is an enemy on the prowl who wants to cause their downfall. Because remember, Satan has started a rebellion. I read recently that there was a a Russian military leader, if I see if I remember this right, in, in the current Russian wars that are going on, there was a Russian military leader who says, okay, Vladimir Putin, he needs to be stopped. We've got to overthrow him. And it got to a point where Vladimir Putin says, okay, he needs to be taken care of. And so now this, you have these two sides that are fully committed to what they believe in. So you've got God's side who's fully committed to showing the universe his true character, and you've got Satan's side who's fully committed to making God look evil and trying to establish a new form of government. And the Bible tells us, turn with me now to Genesis chapter 3. The Bible tells us in Genesis 3 verses 1 to 7, we won't read all of these verses just for the sake of time, but in this story, we see a serpent coming to uh, the garden. Now, Tra tradition holds that the serpent had wings. Now, this is one of the things that the Bible doesn't say outright, but a lot of sources say that the serpent had wings. And you're right, Adam and Eve blamed each other instead of uh, just asking for forgiveness. And so picture this serpent having wings. A lot of, a lot of, most people are afraid of snakes now, but imagine a beautiful snake with wings who's flying through the air, and you see him in the tree, in the forbidden tree. And all of a sudden, it talks. Now, I'm one of those weird people. I love snakes. I used to have several pet snakes. I love snakes. I know I'm weird, but hey, that's just me. Um, but if I had a snake that started talking to me, well, that's a problem. I'm going to call the pastor because something's obviously going wrong, right? A snake should not be talking. Like parrots can talk, but they're just repeating sounds that they hear. Yes, the dragon. It's a, the serpent was a form of, a symbol of Satan in Genesis 3, which is why Revelation 12 also refers to him as the serpent or the dragon. Um, you have never seen a snake. That's interesting. I love snakes, but not everybody does. But here in Genesis 3, Satan has possessed the serpent, and he's speaking through the serpent. That alone should have been a clue to Eve that something was wrong, right? Animals don't talk. Animals were not gifted with the ability to hold conversations, right? Like I said, parrots can talk, but really they're just repeating sounds. They're not actually talking as I'm doing right now. But she stays by the tree. And he comes to her and he says, hey, you know, psst. Has God really said, has he really said that you can't have 
fruit from any tree of the garden? The first line of the Bible. Yes, exactly. And Eve says, no, that's not what God says. God said, you shall not eat of it, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. Now, this is one of those instances where God's word did not need defending. God's word just needed obeying. Understand that clearly. Sometimes God words, God's word needs to be defended. This was not one of those instances. Because notice what Eve said. She said, you shall not eat of it, neither shall you touch it. Now, God didn't say don't touch it. He said, don't eat of it. Eve didn't need to defend God's word. She needed to obey God's word. And so uh, she's now engaged Satan in conversation. Now, she doesn't know that it's him yet, I don't think. And so the woman or the serpent then says to the woman that first lie ever recorded in scripture, you shall not surely die. Now, have you ever heard of Gnosticism? This is where Gnosticism gets its origin. Gnosticism, to oversimplify it and summarize it, is the idea of making God look like the bad guy and Satan look like the good guy. This is where nearly all Hollywood movies and secular entertainment are based off of. Uh, Superman fighting against Lex Luthor, which is Latin for law. Luthor was one of the Protestant reformers. Um, so you have the superhero fighting against the law of God. And, and it's and it's it happens in the Transformers series. It happens in the Marvel series, and in, in anything, anything secular movie, you can almost guarantee that there's this Gnosticism idea in there. In, in the Truman Show with uh, I think it was the Truman Show with uh, Jim Carrey, you see it there as well, and in many others. And it's this idea that Satan comes to you and he says, you know what, that the the Creator, you know, he, he he's the bad guy. I, he's got it all wrong. I'm going to show you where to have the good life. I'm going to show you that that the, the the guy who claims to be God and the Creator, he, he you don't want to serve him. And this is what he's saying to Eve here. You know, God knows you won't die. God knows you're gonna. Your eyes will be opened, and you will be as gods. You will be as gods, knowing good and evil. And so Eve was convinced. She took the fruit. She ate it. And the Bible says that she gave it to Adam. Now what's interesting is, it says, He gave also unto her husband who was with her. Now that phrase, with her, does not appear in the Hebrew. So she wasn't actually with Adam when she ate it. She found him and she gave him the fruit. Now we have a problem. Now Lucifer has succeeded in not only deceiving a third of the angels, but now he's succeeded in deceiving the human race. Because at this point, there was just Adam and Eve. They were the only two humans alive. And so they heard God's voice. He comes to them. He asks them, where are they? Where are you, Adam? Now, I find this very interesting that God says, where are you? He gave them a chance to to expose themselves, basically. to Because... You know, he wanted to save them. He wanted to love them. The Bible says in Revelation 13 that Jesus is the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. In other words, before there was ever sin, Jesus was already planning on being our Savior. That, to me, is real love. That, to me, shows a God who has taken initiative and wants to save us. Now, now we have the story that Adam and Eve have sinned. Read Genesis chapter 3 later. For the full context, God comes to them and he gives them their punishments. And he gives Adam hers, he gives Adam his, and as a symbol of what's going to happen to uh, Satan someday, he gives the serpent his punishment. Now in Genesis 3.15 it says, I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Now a woman in Bible prophecy is symbolic of a church. And Jesus here, we see the first lesson on the truth of righteousness by faith. Because when Adam and Eve sinned, they became depraved. And they could no longer form a righteous character within their own power. And so God had to offer to do it for them. Now turn with me to Isaiah 59. We're going to see what are the consequences of sin. 
So we've talked about Lucifer's rebellion. Now we've talked about man's rebellion. And now we're going to get into some of the consequences about what happens when we sin. Now, in Isaiah 59, verses 1 and 2, this is studying together by Mark Finley. The Bible says, Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save, neither his ear heavy that it cannot hear. There we go. Verse 2, But your iniquities have separated you and your God, and your sins have hid his face from you, so that he will not hear. So, we have our first consequence of sin, is it separates between us and God. Because think about it, when Adam and Eve were going in the Garden of Eden, and they had eaten the fruit, good evening, my friend, they had eaten the fruit, the Bible says their eyes really were opened. But they didn't realize the promise that Satan had promised them. Satan had promised them the good life. Uh, and so, but when Adam and Eve ate the fruit, they realized, hey, you, you don't have any clothes on. I don't have any clothes on. We're naked. And then when they heard God's voice, it says they hid because they were afraid. So sin separates us from God. Sin causes us to be afraid of God. Because think about it. In all throughout history, all of the pagan religions teach that that, that God is an angry deity that needs to be appeased by some form of sacrifice. Either by human sacrifice or by child sacrifice or animal sacrifice. And even the Jews treated God as an angry deity that needed to be appeased. When God is trying to show us God is not an angry deity that needs to be appeased. God is love, right? God is love. Now turn with me next to Romans chapter 6, verse 23. Romans 6... 23. Some of you, if not most of you, probably already know this verse by heart. But we're going to turn there. Romans 6, 23. Romans is the easiest of Paul's letters to find. It's right after the book of Acts. Romans 6, 23. And it says, For the wages of sin is what? What is the wages of sin? What does Paul say is the wages of sin? Death. That's right. The wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Now, as a bit of an aside, um, the Bible does not say that the wages of sin is eternal torment. The Bible says the wages of sin is death. But that's a study for another topic. If you want to know more about death and hell, go to my YouTube channel. We have, there was an, there's an hour and a half long Bible study there on that topic. Now, the wages of sin is death. So what's another thing that happened then? So we've got the wages of sin separates us from God. The wages of sin is also death. Now, death, the wages is something that you earn, right? But God's grace is something that is freely given. Now turn with me to Jeremiah 17. Jeremiah 17, verse 9. We're going to see what sin has done to human nature next. What has sin done to human nature? Jeremiah 17, verse 9. No problem, Andrew. This is called Studying Together by Mark Finley. I got my copy off of eBay. Uh, Jeremiah 17, verse 9. And I just ordered an extra copy so that I can have one at work and at home. Uh, find it on, on eBay, Studying Together by Mark Finley. Jeremiah 17, verse 9 tells us, The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? So the Bible tells us in Genesis 1 and 2, When Adam and Eve were created, they were perfect. They were sinless. They didn't know sin. But the Bible says that after they sinned, our hearts became deceitful. Our hearts became desperately wicked. Oh, no problem. Go definitely. I'll be praying for you, for you and your mom as well. I'll continue to do that. Um, and so, human nature went from being happy and joyful to wicked and deceitful. 
So many movies, uh, especially Disney movies, show us these days, follow your heart, trust your heart. When the Bible says, no, don't trust your heart, your heart is deceitful. Now, human nature has changed. We're going to go back to Romans 5 now. Romans 5. Remember, Romans is right after the book of Acts. Romans 5. Romans 5, verse 12. The Bible says in Romans 5, 12, Whereas by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin. And so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. Now a little bit later, the Bible says that, um, For if by one man's offense death reigned by one, much more they which receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one Jesus Christ. So, when sin came into the world, death came into the world as well. Now, in Romans 6 verse 16 it says, Know ye not that to whom you yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants you are to whom you obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. So sin brings death into the world. Sin separates us from God. And sin, as another other consequence, also affects the natural world. Now, after the flood, the world was split, right? Um, then after the flood, you had all these natural disasters that began happening as well. So sin affects us as humans. It affects us mentally, spiritually, emotionally. And it also affects the natural world. Now turn with me to Hebrews chapter 2. What is the solution? We've talked about God's character. We've talked about Lucifer's rebellion. Then we talked about man's rebellion. We talked a little bit about the consequences of sin. Now what about the solution? What does the Bible say is the solution? Turn with me to Hebrews chapter 2, verse 14 to 17. The Bible says, in Hebrews 2, For as much then, as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise partook of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is, the devil. So, Jesus decided that he was going to come and be one of us, so that through his life, death, and resurrection, he could destroy the devil. It says, And then deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. For verily, notice this, he took not on him the nature of the angels, but he took on him the seed of Abraham. Jesus didn't come in a angelic humanity. He didn't come in a divine flesh. He came as one of us. He came as one with our nature. The Bible says he took on him the seed of Abraham. He came with a nature like ours. We have a fallen human flesh. And Jesus had the same nature. That does not make him a sinner. A lot of people, and this comes from Catholicism, people, many people believe in something called the original sin, which basically says that it's a sin to be human. But if it's a sin to be human, that would have made Jesus a sinner. Because the Bible says he took on him the nature of Abraham. We are not made... Uh, Sinners because we are human. We are sinners because we choose to be. And it says, Wherefore in all things it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in, pertaining, in things pertaining to God to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. So God's solution was to become one of us, right? Now, the, the law of God demands the life of the person who breaks his law. And so Jesus, being one equal with the Father, is the only one who could have come and died as our substitute. An angel could not die for us, right? Because they're not equal with the law of God. I can't die for your sins because I'm a sinner too. So there was only one being in all the universe that could die for our sins and be our Savior, and that is Jesus. And the Bible says in Hebrews that he came to be one of us. Now, in Romans 5, we're back to Romans 5. Romans 5, starting in verse 17. 
starting in verse 17, For if by one man's offense death reigned by one, much more they which receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one, that is, Jesus Christ. Therefore, as by the offense of one judgment came upon all men to condemnation, even so, even so, by the righteousness of one, that is, Jesus, the free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. For as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so by the obedience of one man shall many be made righteous. So, God's solution was to become one of us, to live as one of us, to fight temptation like one of us, and to overcome like one of us. So that that way, uh, by the obedience of Jesus, we could be made righteous. One of my favorite books. In the book Desire of Ages, I think it's page 28, it says we were treated, or Jesus was treated as we deserve so that we could be treated as he deserves. And that, to me, is really, really powerful. Now, Romans 3, turn with me to Romans 3. Romans 3, verses 24 and 25. The Bible says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, uh, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God hath set forth to be a propitiation or a sacrifice through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are past through the forbearance of God. So Jesus died for us in order to pay the penalty for my sins, for your sins, so that you can have the opportunity to be saved. Now, remember we talked about the natural disasters. So does it sound like God is the one at fault for those natural disasters? Is God the one at fault because people died in the Maui fires? Is God the one at fault for the people who are dying in the disasters worldwide? If God is love, if God is doing everything he possibly can, for those who have been here since the beginning of this study tonight, God cannot possibly be the one who is at fault for what's going on in the world. The Bible shows us that we are the ones who chose this. We are the ones who chose sin and its consequences. Now, we are not Adam and Eve, right? But we made the same choices as them. There's not a single one of you watching, not a single person in my own house that has not chosen sin at some point. And so because of that, we are the ones responsible for the fact that the world is going nuts right now. Now, there is a way out, though, and that way is Jesus. In Isaiah 41, 13, turn with me to Isaiah 41. I'm going to go back to Isaiah 41. This is a new Bible, and I'm still getting used to grabbing the pages to turn. Sometimes I go too far. Isaiah 41, 13, the Bible says, For I, the Lord thy God, will hold thy right hand, saying unto thee, Fear not, I will help thee, God is saying to us. So there is a way out of all of the political divisiveness, all the natural disasters, all the extreme racism going on in the world. All the wealth inequality, all the, uh, everything negative going on in the world, there is a solution, there is a way out, and that way out is Jesus Christ himself. Nothing else will work. Social justice will not work. Feminism will not work. Climate change activism will not work. And the reason they will not work is because they do not have Jesus in them. Now, God will put an end. People ask, how can God see everything going on in the world today and not do anything about it? God is doing something about it. And what he is doing about it will ensure that sin will never again happen for the rest of all eternity. And my friends, you and I can make sure that we are on the winning side and that we can see the reality of those promises. Now, 
Ezekiel 28, 18 says that God will bring Satan to ashes. He will put an end to sin, to Satan, and wickedness. The Bible says in Revelation 21, verses 4, that God will make all things new. In fact, that is our next text. Let's turn to Revelation 21. Why do people think that they can force Jesus to return? We cannot force Jesus to return, but I believe it is within our power to hasten that event because it is within our power to share the gospel. In Matthew 14, no, sorry, Matthew 24, I believe it's verse 14, says that uh, the end comes after we share the gospel with the world. And um, we have the ability to share the gospel with the world. Now, in Revelation 21, verses 1 through 5, just for the sake of time, I'm going to summarize this rather than read all of it. But God says in verse 4, He will wipe away all tears. There won't be any more death, no more sorrow, no crying, no more pain. All of these disasters that are going on in the world, gone. All of the pain caused by the Maui fires, never again. All of the lives lost in the floods and, and all that stuff, never again. Now, one more text in Nahum chapter 1, verse 9. Now, I never remember where Nahum is, so you'll have to pardon me. I'm going to have to look it up. Nahum. Nahum is one of those books that I can never find, so I always have to look up the page number. Nahum chapter 1 verse 9 yeah nobody knows the time I 100% agree with you on that Nahum chapter 1 verse 9 it says affliction or that's another word for sin shall not rise up the second time so one of the reasons that God did not destroy Lucifer right away when he first rebelled in heaven was because one everybody else would have served God out of fear so evil, powerful men push the issue of controlling world events. Yes, that's true to some extent. But remember, humanity is not our enemy. We are not each other's enemy. Our enemy is Satan and his evil angels. But also, God didn't destroy Lucifer right away because the way that God is conducting this, what we call the great controversy, ensures that when God finally destroys sin and Satan and the wicked and all the evil angels, when God finally accomplishes that act, sin will never rise up again. Now, God will never take away our freedom of choice. He will never take away our freedom of choice. And so we will always have the freedom to choose, but the Bible says it will never happen again. And the reason for that is because we have seen Satan's form of government and it has not worked out. And we simply do not want it anymore because they want to force Jesus' hand. I'm not sure what you mean by that. The, the, the leaders? Uh, maybe clarify what you mean, if you would, please. Sin will never rise again. Now, in verse 10, it says, They be folded together, the wicked we are folded together as thorns, while they are drunken as drunkards, they shall be devoured as stubble fully dry. So God will so thoroughly destroy the wicked that there won't be any a, any single trace of the wicked left, right? They won't be tortured for all eternity. Again, if you want more on that, go watch my YouTube video. It's fairly recent. It's an hour and a half. But God will make a complete end of sin, of Satan, of, of the wicked, and rebellion will never happen again in God's universe. A thousand years of peace, the millennium... Uh, Go to the Amazing Facts website and study their study on the millennium. Uh, the leaders of the world are not trying to force Jesus' hand. They're trying to do other things. Um, but you might like a... Um, what's the series? Total Onslaught by Walter Weiss. If you have not heard of him, I recommend watching that series, Total Onslaught by Walter Veith on YouTube. V-E-I-T-H. And he goes in-depth on some of, of what world leaders are doing. Another series he does is called Crete to Malta, where he goes over similar things. Definitely check those out. 
Now, God is not the one at fault for all the disasters going on in the world today. In fact, um, these disasters happen because of man's sin, and they are increasing in direct proportion to the wickedness of man. Jesus said that in the last days, humanity would be as it was in the days of Noah. Now, in the days of Noah, all kinds of wickedness were going on. You could read about all the different kinds of wickedness before the flood. Uh, read about that. Paul talked about it in Romans chapter 1. And then God sent the flood to wipe clean the earth and start over. And Jesus said, just before he returns, humanity is going to be like that again. Now, um, I believe we're there, right? And uh, Erica, are you talking about this one? Yeah, this is what I, I use for work. Doesn't do the best job at keeping things cold, but I like it. I got it at Target, by the way. Um, so you might check Target, you might find it there. But uh, all of this will one day be at an end. And um, all the wickedness of humanity will be dealt with. God cleansed the world by a flood last time. This time, God's cleansing the world by fire. And that is what the lake of fire will be. So is God the one at fault for all the disasters happening in the world today? No, he's not. Now, for more information, we've been on the live stream for about an hour. Um, for more information, I highly recommend you look up a book. You can find it for free online called The Great Controversy. And read chapter 29 called The Origin of Evil. And um, it will discuss... Uh, in more detail than we have gone into tonight, Why Satan Rebelled. Um, also read in a book called The Patriarchs of Prophets on uh, Lucifer's Rebellion as well. Now, while we cannot control the disasters that are going on in the world today, we can control what our eternal destiny is. Now, do we have any praises or prayer requests for those just joining we're just finish, finishing up a bible study on the origin of evil oh whoops my tablet decided it wanted to slip and slide away there we go all right hopefully it stays we're just finishing up a bible study from this book called studying together by mark finley and the study was on page five called the origin of evil so i don't know if you guys want to Screenshot that if you want to. You can find this book on eBay. Now, do we have any final comments, praises, prayer requests? I got to get off of here soon and go to bed because I got work tomorrow. Any praises, prayer requests, anything like that? The toxic metals? Yes, we can do that. I want what God wants. Yes, praise the Lord. Absolutely. So those just joining, we're finishing up our Bible study. It will be available to watch on Instagram. If for some reason there's a problem, then I will upload it to my YouTube channel as well. But it should be on Instagram uh, right after we finish the live stream. All right, guys, any prayer requests? Remember, this is a public forum, so if you share your prayer requests, other people will see it. If you want to just put silence, you're welcome to just put silent. God knows what your prayer requests are. Don't forget to praise God as well. So if you have praises, not a problem, Dylan. This is called Studying Together by Mark Finley. This is the revised version, the black cover. Studying Together by Mark Finley. You can find it on eBay. That's where I've got my copies at. All right. All right, guys. I appreciate all the follows, the likes, and the shares. Let's pray, and uh, we'll sign off for the night, and I will see you on another live stream. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for reminding us of the truth that you do care. You are intricately involved with what is going on in the world. None of this takes you by surprise. You are in control. While evil men think that they are the ones in control, Lord God, you are the one really in control. Please help us to trust you. Please help us not to be those whose hearts fail them for fear. Please forgive us for our sins, transform us and prepare us for the times that are coming. Most importantly, prepare us to see Jesus face to face.
in your name. Amen. All right, guys, I will see you on the next one.